So the title of my talk, as you can see, is Energy Subtraction Methods as an Alternative to Conventional uh, X-ray and Geography. Um, so vascular diseases, as you know, are severe narrowing or blockages of blood vessels, and cardiovascular diseases are currently the number one cause of death worldwide, and they account for 30% of uh, global deaths. <coughs> can everyone hear me? Okay. Yep. Uh, and then the number one form of, or the most common form of uh, cardiovascular disease are coronary artery diseases. So when it comes to imaging vascular diseases, x-ray angiography is used in a vast majority of uh, these cases. And it's used to assess the severity and location of the uh, vessel narrowing. And one, one of the most common forms is known as digital subtraction angiography, or, or DSA. Uh, so this is an example of DSA in, in the head or cerebral angiography. Um, so first the mask image is acquired, and you can see that this is just the anatomy, this is the skull, this is the maxilla and the mandible of it. Um, but typically what we can't see, as we know in an x-ray, are the blood vessels. So in order to be able to see them, a radio-opaque dye is injected, um, typically iodine, and then another image is acquired. Now, you can start to see that there are blood vessels in this area here. Um, however, the background and overlying structure obscure the view of the vasculature. So uh, for DSA, uh, the mask and contrast images are subtracted and we get a final image that looks like this. So DSA is considered the gold standard of vascular imaging and uh, as you can see, uh, we get a very clear image of the blood vessels. Now the problem with DSA, this might be obvious, is that um, if there is patient motion between the mask and the contrast image, uh, we get an image with patient motion or motion artifacts. And again, this compromises the, the image quality. So you can't see the blood, vas blood vessels here um, from these light and dark regions that obscure it. So the head is pretty rigid. Um, as you can imagine, uh, this method would be very difficult to use for an organ that is in motion like the heart. So this is an example of DSA in the heart. So this is, a, again, a mask image. Uh, you can see up here. Uh, the catheter that's ready to inject the blood vessels with iodine. Um, and this is of the heart. You can see the heart here. And uh, then iodine is injected um, to get a contrast image. Now, I also call this image a coronary angiogram, um, just because this is what a coronary angiogram typically looks like. Uh, and for coronary angiography, there's actually no subtraction methods. Um, and so compared to DSA, this would require a higher iodine concentration and also um, a higher radiation exposure just to be able to see the blood vessels. So when uh, the mass of contrast images are subtracted, even with motion correction, which has been done here, um, you can see that uh, cardiac imaging does not benefit from DSA. Yes? Um, so if you assume that you're in the EMT, why do you acquire the mass? Oh, uh, this is just to show an example. This paper was just to show an example of, of uh, DSA in the heart, and they were trying to do a motion correction for it. Yeah, but it's a good question. Uh, so, yeah, and so um, so cardiac imaging uh, doesn't benefit from DSA, again, because motion artifacts will compromise the image quality. So we have this gold standard in vascular imaging that we can't use to image a critical structure. So an alternative approach, um, is one known as dual energy, or as I have been calling it uh, throughout my career, is energy subtraction angiography, also known as ESA. And basically the, the, the uh, idea is to eliminate the need for a mask image um, and acquire two contrast images at two different KVs to get an image that is hopefully similar uh, to DSA, so a DSA-like image. And the physics behind it is that um, there's two uh, Images are acquired at two different uh, KVs, and these, uh, so I'm showing here two different spectra, and these uh, spectra have a different uh, mean energy, and these mean energies have to be separated as much as possible because it's a subtraction method, and I'll show why. Um, and that's because iodine and water um, have different mass, uh, different uh, attenuation properties. So here I'm showing the mass attenuation coefficient as a function of uh, photon energy. I'm sure you've seen this before. Um, but just to illustrate a point, if I 
um, use a monoenergetic approximation um, for the, the mean KVs that I showed before, so 41 and, and 86. Um, this is the difference between, I'm, I'm showing the difference between uh, the mass continuation coefficients at those KVs, and you can see that there's a large difference for iodine. And this is good because it's a subtraction method and we want to preserve the iodine, whereas we want to get rid of the soft tissue, the water. So that's, that's good that we have a small difference there. So we don't use monoenergetic uh, beams, we use polyenergetic beams. So just to show you the basic physics behind the signal formation, uh, we do this on a per pixel basis. So this is for DSA. So we have a, uh, an energy spectrum here at 63 kV, and we project it through 20 centimeters or a body of water, um, and we get a uh, spectrum at the uh, detector, which I've labeled here. Um, and then iodine is injected, and the same spectrum is projected through this phantom and we get a spectrum that looks like this. So DSA is basically, since, it's, since the pixel values are proportional to these energy spectra, uh, DSA is basically taking the difference in the area between these two um, uh, energy spectra. And this will give the logarithmic, it's the logarithmic projection of the um, iodine transmission factor. If you use a monoenergetic approximation. Um, for ESA, typically two calibration images are acquired. I can talk about this after, uh, it's just a little confusing, but typically we acquire calibration images um, before the scans. And um, a low KV energy spectrum is projected through um, iodine and water, so no mask image. Um, and similarly, uh, high KV uh, energy spectrum is projected through. And um, again, we take the the difference in the area between the calibration and the uh, contrast um, uh, energy spectra, and again we end up with um, we end up with a logarithmic projection of the transmission factor of iodine, which in this case is the difference between the low and the high KV, and again it's um, proportional to the density and the thickness of the iodine. So when I first started this project, um, I wanted to see what these images would look like. Um, so first, uh, the first thing I did was I took a jug of water and a, a PMMA step wedge and, um, and also an IV step wedge and I started imaging. So for DSA, um, here I'm just showing a mask image. This is of a 20 centimeter tank of water and a PMMA step wedge and I acquired it at 80 kB and 10 MAF. Um, I'm not going to show the contrast images because I've got two for the ESA. Um, so this is what the contrast images look, for, look like for ESA. Um, and I acquired the low uh, acquired one image at uh, 50 kV and 20 MAS, and the other one at 120 kV, and the other at 20 MAS. And I used uh, 2.5 millimeters of copper because, as I mentioned, the energy spectra have to be separated um, as much as possible to get good subtraction. Um, and then I ended up with images that looked like this. So at this point, I should say that um, in past literature. Uh, has been said that the image quality for ESA or dual energy in radiography was about two to five times worse than DSA. But when I looked at these images when I first started my project, they looked quite similar. So, um, I mean, you can still see part of the PMMA step wedge here and also here because of uh, beam hardening, but overall they look similar to each other. So I went back and looked at the literature in the 1990s. So this is a, an example of uh, one of the experiments they did in uh, 1991. This is of a, a dog start. This is an IV injection. And they performed dual energy on it. You can see the catheter here and the whole structure um, is the heart. Um, and <clears throat> it looks like a pretty decent image, uh, especially compared to the DSA image where, there, where it shows a, a lot of motion artifacts so you can't even make out the heart. Um, and there's another structure here. Um, and you can see that the catheter has moved uh, quite a bit. So this image uh, looks, looks a lot better than this image. However, ESA was never adopted into the clinic. And I was sort of in a position where I thought, well, I have this great image and this great idea, so why was it never implemented? So I had to ask myself, what makes a good ESA or dual energy image? And why didn't ESA work in the past? Were there any technical issues? Was it, um, was it a physical issue? So I had to investigate what determines um, a good ESA image. So to do that, uh, first I, 
the first thing I wanted to do was develop a theoretical model of image quality. So um, something that was free of uh, anything experimental. Uh, so I wanted to uh, measure the ID and SNR uh, for the same exposure between uh, ESA and DSA. I wanted to use that as a metric of comparison. Then I wanted to experimentally validate the model just to make sure that um, if it wasn't a physics issue, perhaps it was a technical issue and that had to be sorted. So I needed to identify any necessary conditions uh, that would allow ESA to be successful to look at scatter, read noise, and quantum efficiency experimentally. Um, and once, once I've done that, um, I wanted to determine um, optimal or near optimal parameters for a wide range of conditions and then apply um, an optimization study to make technique recommendations. So in my theoretical model, um, I used a simple configuration um, where I have, I, I kept the model the same for ESA and DSA. So for both methods, I used uh, 20 centimeters of water and uh, different concentrations of iodine. So experimentally, I had a tank of water and a step wedge that was filled with iodine. Um, and then I kept a, an air gap of 30 centimeters between the back of the phantom and the detector. So then I acquired images um, and I also performed calculations uh, theoretically. Um, so the first metric of comparison that I used was the Rose SNR. And um, some of you might know what the Rose SNR is, but just to uh, illustrate it here, um, basically I took the mean um, of the region of interest in the background and then the mean of the region of interest in the iodine uh, region. Um, and then I divided it by the standard deviation. And standard deviation was calculated by taking the difference in two images that were similar and dividing it by root two, which is what I'm showing here. Um, and, then I and then I normalized it by the uh, patient entrance error karma. And um, again, you can see, I mean, for similar error karma, DSA is even lower. The image quality looks the same between the two, which again was surprising. Um, so I used there, there were a lot of ways of normalizing the ID and SNR between DSA and ESA. Um, uh, you know, in the literature, when I look at the literature, um, you know, they use like either patient dose or dose at the detector. Um, I decided to use uh, uh, patient entrance error karma. Um, and this is because uh, it's, pro it's approximately equal to the dose in air. Um, and it's easy to measure with an ion chamber. So experimentally what I did was I placed an ion chamber right where the, right where the uh, face of the phantom would be, and then I would remove the phantom and just measure the um, exposure for um, all the techni techniques that were used for both ESA and DSA. The second metric of comparison that, that I used was the sum of variance, which I just, I, I call that an extension of the Rose SNR. So all I'm doing is adding um, uh, all I'm doing is adding the noise component of the iodine region, um, which is, which I think is better because this is actually what you see in the image. It's good to take into account the noise of iodine. So I just add summing those in quadrature. Um, also, I wanted to compare uh, my experimental data with my theoretical uh, model. And as you can see, there's a lot of uh, crosstalk between these pixels. There's, there's, the pixels appear to be correlated with each other. So in order to uh, uh, and in my theoretical model, I don't assume, I assume that these pixels are not correlated. So in order to uh, take that into account, um, I had to make these pixels bigger to take the average between, so I had to bin the pixels um, and then take the average in these pixels just to remove that correlation. Um, so the way, that I, the way that I would know if, if I removed the correlation between them is if the auto covariance was equal to the variance. So basically I just took an image and I, um, took a region of interest and I started binning pixels and I would measure the auto covariance and the variance and um, once the ratio between the two was equal to one. So here I'm showing the auto covariance um, to variance ratio as a function of a uh, number of bin pixels. So this is where the region is equal to one. Um, and if the uh, ratio was less than one, then I knew that the pixels were still correlated with each other. But 
if the pixels were, uh, if the, sorry, if the ratio was equal to one, then I knew that the pixels uh, were no longer correlated and I could, use, uh, I could use that bin pixel size. So I ended up going with an eight by eight uh, pixel area just because um, it was appropriate for the size of the region of interest that was used. So then um, I was able to compare my experimental and theoretical results. So here I'm showing the SNR per root air karma as a function of iodine mass loading. Uh, so above I'm showing the rows SNR for DSA and ESA, and then the sum of variance SNR for uh, uh, DSA and ESA. And as you can see, the uh, image quality between ES for ESA competes quite well with DSA, which I found pretty surprising considering that the literature had said that the um, that the SNR was a factor of two to five lower uh, compared to DSA, and even for the sum of variance, um, for for most um, for low iodine concentrations, uh, ESA competed quite well with DSA. However, when you get to higher um, iodine mass loadings, which are typically not used, um, ESA starts to degrade uh, with uh, increasing iodine mass loadings. Um, so I found this kind of shocking, but then um, I compared uh, my experimental results to the theoretical uh, model and um, I had excellent agreement between uh, experiment and theory. So, I mean, this was shocking. I had to ask myself, well, what technical components then, I mean, it's not a physical issue, obviously. Um, it appears that our math, ma our math was correct, but um, so what technical components uh, hindered ESA from working in the past. And so I looked at uh, three potential technical limitations that would generally degrade image quality for uh, radiography. Um, the first one being scatter, uh, second one being detector read noise, and the third one being cesium iodide, uh, well, the thickness, which is related to the quantum efficiency of the detector. So uh, first I looked at the impact of read noise and I found, uh, so first I uh, calculated the um, SNR per root air crema um, as a function of readout noise. So I just added a readout noise component into the, um, in, in, I just incorporated that into my model and then solved for it. So this is, um, sorry, this is SNR per root air crema as a function of acceptable read noise. And for, I looked at where the SNR per root air crema uh, decreased by about 10%. And I found that um, ESA could tolerate about one fifth the amount of read noise that DSA uh, that DSA could, um, and this was good to know because um, in the past, um, well, even current detectors, um, our target for, sorry, our target detector goal was our chroma was 0 0.05 micrograde. So this is how much DSA could tolerate. But if we, when I measured the um, uh, quantum limit, so the amount of uh, air chroma that could be, uh, that would reach the detector, so how much the, the detector could tolerate, I measured that to be 0 0.4 uh, micrograde for, a, for like a typical hospital detector. But in the lab that I was in, we had a, this detector that was shipped in from Korea and uh, it, was, um, it had a quantum limit of about 0 0.016 micrograde, so much lower than um, than what we needed uh, to achieve our, our target goal. So this is potentially a reason why ESA didn't work in the past is because detectors uh, needed to have a lower quantum limit um, and this, this can be achievable today but it probably wasn't achievable back in the 1990s. Uh, the second thing, so I did a similar analysis for scatter. Um, so first I measured, uh, I just measured the scatter to primary ratio um, experimentally and theoretically. So experimentally what I did is I just um, through a tank of water um, right in front of where the detector would be and I put the ion chamber right in front of where the detector would be um, and I started taking measurements of the exposure and I moved, I just varied the air gap between the back of the phantom and the ion chamber so eventually I would get rid of a scatter measurement and I would just get a, um, an estimate of what the primary measurement would be. Um, so first I Theoretically, I plotted the iodine SNR for root air karma as a function of acceptable scatter ratio. And again, I looked at um, where the 10% decrease mark was, and I found that for ESA to work, um, the scatter to primary ratio needs to be less than 0 0.05, which is 5% scatter, which is pretty low. Um, and this, is, this could have been a problem 
uh, back in the 1990s because the detectors were a lot smaller back then, so you couldn't just move them away from the patient. Uh, you'd have you'd be dealing with magnification issues. So, uh, but detectors today are a little bit larger, so this might be okay if we increase the air gap between uh, the back of the patient and the detector. So experimentally, I I looked at um, what air gap would uh, would give about five percent. And I found that at about 30 centimeters, uh, scatter to primary ratio was about 0 0.03 to 0 0.05, which was acceptable. So um, this, is, this is good to know. 30 centimeters, when I looked up in the literature, it seemed like uh, it was an appropriate air gap to use, which, was, which is great. Um, but probably, not, uh, probably could not be used back in the 1990s. The last thing I looked at um, was the uh, cesium iodide thickness which is related to the quantum efficiency. So um, here I'm plotting the iodine SNR per root air chroma as a function of uh, cesium iodide thickness. And um, so the detector we had used um, had a cesium iodide thickness of about 0.5%, oh, sorry, 0 0.5 millimeters. And uh, typically detectors are about 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 uh, millimeters. So if you use a, a detector that's about 0 0.3 millimeters, this will degrade image quality for you, say, by about 10%, uh, which is not, which is fine. Um, if you go a little bit thinner to 0 0.2, um, you'll get about 15%. And um, if you increase the thickness to one millimeter, um, you'll only increase the iodine star by 3%. But if you look at the comparison between DSA and ESA, I mean, there's not really um, a difference between the two. So um, and in the literature, they kind of compared dual energy to DSA. So this would be a reason as to why uh, ESA was, was worse than DSA, although it's important to take into account the cesium iodide thickness. Uh, so just to conclude, um, the following is required to make uh, ESA successful. So having an air gap of about 30 centimeters uh, to achieve a scattered to primary ratio that's about uh, 5%. Um, having a very low detector read noise. Um, so either a CSI or CMOS detector would work, and having a cesium iodide thickness, thickness of about 0.3 to 0.5 millimeters. So we think that ESA would be a, a viable alternative to DSA, especially when there's uh, areas of um, patient motion. Yes? Actually, a quick question about the ESA technique that you use. Yeah. So you take two images of two different KVPs. Do those images have like the same MAS and like the same noise properties? before you do the subtraction? Or yeah, they typically don't have the same noise properties before I do the subtraction. It's a good, it's a good point, because when you are dealing with CT, um, you want to keep uh, constant noise. But for radiography, it doesn't seem to be as big of an issue. Yeah, I was just trying to think like whether, you, whether that's another free parameter that you could sort of tune to sort of optimize the, the noise in that output image. Yeah, actually, that's what I'm talking about next, is oh. like how to optimize it. Yeah, no, it's a good, uh, it's a good question. Because um, there's a lot of parameters that go into um, optimization, um, and you'll see. Um, yeah. So I'm almost finished. I'm just going to go into the optimization part. So, uh, um, so yeah, we want to optimize iodine SNR at uh, low iodine concentrations. Um, the way that I thought about doing it was optimizing it with respect to the air chroma ratio between the low and the high KV. So keeping the total air chroma constant. Um, just because we want to compare it to the gold standard. I don't want to increase the, the, uh, the air chroma. Um, and I know that the image quality is related ultimately to the number of photons. So ultimately I want to, uh, related to the ratio between the low and high, the number of quanta for low and high KB. Um, so we want, to, yeah, we want to relate it to physical parameters such as the KB and the MAS. And uh, I want to determine near optimal iodine SNR for a set of parameters. Um, so, I mean, the SNR will depend on patient thickness, iodine concentration, and detector material. And I also want to quantify the tube heat loading for ESA compared to DSA. Um, this is pretty important. Um, and the, the tube loading is proportional to KB times MAS. Uh, so the first thing I did was just look at um, the MAS ratio. So the MAS ratio is uh, MAS low to high. So here I'm plotting the rose SNR. Um, as a function of the MAS ratio, um, and then over here is the sum of variance of iodine SNR as a function of MAS ratio. And this is for the same 
iodine concentration. Um, if you'll recall, the rose SNR doesn't have the uh, iodine noise component. Read 11. Please dial 26560. Read 11. Please dial 
we start looking at different parameters, we wanted to boil it down. Um, you know, we wanted to be able to look at different parameters together. So the other parameter we looked at was patient size. So patients come in different sizes. And <coughs> so here I'm plotting the water thickness um, as a function of MAS ratio. And this is the rows SNR. Um, and this is the sum of variance SNR. So I'm plotting for 60 and 120 kb. Um, and this is the polyenergetic calculation. So again, water thickness is a function of MAS ratio. And so if, if we were to take a, like a line profile across this, um, this graph, we would, well, this uh, contour plot, we would get a graph that looks like the um, rows SNR versus MAS ratio. Um, this is just for a specific uh, water thickness. So we're looking at about seven centimeters, which could be a person's arm. Um, the optimal MAS ratio is about 0 0.3. This line here is going through um, the MAS ratio that would give the optimal iodine SNR, and this is the 10% uh, mark here. So for seven, um, the, uh, the optimal MAS ratio is about 0.3, with a range of about 0.1 to 0.7 MAS. And similarly for the sum of variance methods. If we go to 15 centimeters, um, the optimal MAS ratio is about 0.4, with a range of 0.2 to 0.9, um, similarly for some variance. And then finally, for 30 centimeters, sorry if you can't see this, uh, the, optimal MAS, the, the optimal would be 0.6 MAS, with a range of 0.4 to 1.5, and it's uh, similar for the sum of variance method. Um, so, you know, for all these, for 60 and 120 kV, um, 0.4 to 0.7 would cover a vast majority of, of thicknesses that you see here. Uh, similarly, with the sum of variance method. And by the way, I would go with the sum of variance method all the time, but this is just to show um, the comparison between the two uh, metrics. Um, and then I looked at, here I'm just, this plot didn't change, but the difference is this is the rows of SNR as the effective energies that we use. So this is the monoenergetic approximation. And we just wanted to confirm again that the monoenergetic approximation would give um, similar values to what we expect. So we expect the ratio between the low and the high to be the same as the MAS ratio, which it is. Um, so this is, this is good. Uh, one of the last things was uh, detector material. So um, detectors are not just uh, cesium iodide. Um, they are also gadolinium-based or selenium-based. So here I'm just um, just demonstrating that the rosasnar um, peruderchrom has a function of MAS ratio for different um, detector materials, and you can see that between all three of them here, um, these are really common materials that we use. Uh, there's not a there's not a significant difference between the the SNR, um, which is good. So we don't have to uh, look at we don't have to do this optimization approach for different detectors. Um, and as you know. Uh, when you're within 10%, that's quite a wide range of, of MAS ratios that could be used. Do you, you, if you picked um, uh, the optimal MAS ratio for cesium iodide, it would be near optimal for, say, gadolinium or selenium. Yeah, and lastly, um, we look at heat units. So um, I consider this important. Um, uh, so for ESA, um, if we look here, so this is for this, these are ESA, this is DSA. Um, always compare it to DSA, it's the reference standard. Um, this is 15120, uh, with an op I used a 20 and 20, which is the optimal um, MAS ratio. Similarly, 16 120, again, I used the optimal MAS ratio, same with 70. And I found that, um, so 50, uh, for 50, ESA is about two times greater than that of DSA at 15 120. Um, now, 15, 50 kV is typically not used in the clinic. Um, I would go up to maybe 60, even 60 might be a little bit low. So 70 or 80 uh, might be appropriate, but the heat units uh, tend to decrease as the kV uh, increases because the MAS, the optimal MAS ratio um, also decreases. Um, but also ESA uh, may require a few images. So the total number of heat units at the end of an exam may not be um, may be competitive to DSA. may still be a little bit more, um, but it's not, a, it's not a showstopper for this method. Lastly, um, I'm just plotting the iodine SNR for root as a function of uh, iodine mass loading. 
And um, this is similar to the plot I showed before, except the difference is now I have a whole lot of KVs on here, um, and I'm plotting them at uh, optimal or near optimal um, uh, MAS ratio. So at the top here, this is the rose uh, SNR, and uh, these ones here are the sum of variance SNR. Um, so again, 50 kV, as I showed before, we happen to we just happen to select the optimal MAS ratio, which was one. Um, it competes quite well with uh, DSA. You can see here that the 50 kV is in red um, for both for both sum variance and rose SNR. Um, 60 kV is in green, and it competes. This still competes quite well. Um, there's about an 8 percent difference between DSA and ESA at uh, low iodine concentrations for the sum of variance method. And for 70 kV, there's about a 70 percent difference um, between the uh, between ESA and DSA. Now, 70 and 120 were the kVs that were used um, in the 1990s. So this again could be another reason, another contributing factor as to why ESA wasn't as good as DSA in the past. Um, but it's just something to keep in mind. Um, they probably also didn't use, weren't looking at optimal an optimal MAS ratio either. Um, if they were to use one, they would have been kind of on the, they would have been a little bit lower than the 10 percent uh, decrease point. So. And what is the fast blue line on the bottom of that figure? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. I didn't explain that. Um, so this line here is just showing the important, uh, or I won't say the important, but the ID mass loadings that are typically used. So I did plot for, I, I did, um, I applied these ones because I believe that when I saw some of the images um, of, when I, when I was looking at through images, I, I just found that they were pumping iodine into the into the animal that they were using. So I figured that they were probably using higher um, iodine mass loadings. So I just wanted to see what the graph would look like um, in that region. But typically, the iodine mass loadings that are used are within this in that region. So just to summarize, on the right side, if the high iodine is very high results with that. Yeah, so this, this sentence here actually incorporates the noise of iodine, whereas this one is the rose SNR and doesn't incorporate the noise. So um, as the iodine increases, yeah, you get, it starts to fall off, starts to decrease. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so yeah, just to conclude, um, we need a very low noise detector with excellent scatter rejection. Um, <clears throat> we need some recommendations for the optimal ID SNR. So for 60 kV, um, 60 and 120 kV, um, 0.5 MAS ratio could be used, um, or 70.3 would be used, should be used. Um, it's applicable for any patient size and detector material. Um, the heat loading may be overcome, so you can acquire the cardiac images uh, during the diastole phase. Um, and yeah, so and ESA again would be a viable alternative to where DSA wouldn't work, work which is in any case where there's motion. Um, I'll just go through this. This is kind of the future work. Um, I continued this work into my postdoc. Oh no, this first. Uh, so this is one of the things I did before I left um, Western. Was I uh, threw a phantom on the on the uh, machine and just. And it's just so I'm Abby Rankin, please. Rosemary Fitzgerald, please contact extension 26560. Rosemary Fitzgerald, please contact extension 26560. So this is a random phantom here. Um, I don't know what these bands are. I never quite knew what they were. But um, they're not air because air is, uh, is white. But uh, anyway, I didn't know what they were. Um, but I also have tubes of iodine filled in here. And you can't really see them. This is a typical conventional coronary angiogram at, at 80 kV. Um, but when I did the ESA subtraction with 60 and 120, um, you can see that the, the background has been kind of um, suppressed a little bit, but the iodine um, tube has now been enhanced, which is good. And I mean, having, a, having this background may not be a total showstopper, uh, just because it may be good for landmarking. Um, but that's something that I would have to consult either a cardiologist over. <laughs> uh, but I did carry this work into my postdoc. Um, 
Oh yeah, sorry. I I mentioned that I don't know what they were. I I I I always thought that they were air, but then I realized that air is actually white to be white in the image. So I wasn't too clear. But yeah, they're not very uh, not very pretty. <laughs> um, but the ESA does an okay job at subtracting them or at least suppressing them. Uh, and then uh, lastly, I, I continue this work into my postdoc, as I mentioned. Um, this is a, an image of a, we just kind of piggyback um, off a, I know it's a weird word to use, but we did piggyback off of um, a scan that they were, that some of the cardiologists were doing. So uh, uh, we did a, a dual energy scan. And so here I'm showing uh, 60 kV and 120 kV, um, and then this is the uh, ESA. This is the the reconstruction. So this is actually more for um, this is a this is an IR unit, uh, Siemens IR unit. So I was able to do the reconstruction, and here I'm just kind of playing around with the filters a little bit, but um, but this is kind of the final image, and this is good because this background has been completely removed from this image, and you can see. The, the vasculature uh, quite clearly. So um, this method does have promise. Uh, we just actually submitted this to SPIE. It was accepted. So um, one of the uh, we have an R I have an R21. So my grad student is going to give a talk on on this uh, subject at SPIE. So um, I was pretty happy with it because uh, it started off with you know started off as an idea that we thought wouldn't work, and now it's come into uh, now it's been revised, I guess. So, yes, yeah, so I'd like to thank you uh, for being here. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, and that's my email if you want to reach me. Can you tell us a little bit, a bit about the, uh, the heat loading for the cardiac imaging? Um, so, w when you said it was at, at, what, at what phase did you take those images? To reduce that? Oh, uh, so these images I took, um, I didn't take them at any phase. I just, um, I just did the calculation. So heat, heat, the heat loading um, calculation is KV, it's a product of KV and MAS. So basically I just did the calculation and found that if I was to use, you know, 50 and 120 with an MAS of 20 and 20 for both, this is what my total heat, heat loading unit would be for two images. Um, and I did the same thing with DSA. So if I have 80 kV, 80 kV, mask and contrast, um, and then with a MAS of 10, with my total heat loading unit would be, I think it was 1,600. But yeah, so for 50 and 120, um, the heat loading units come out to about two times uh, that of DSA. And how much of, is that a limit to, uh, to imaging? Is that, I mean, uh, how much attention do people pay to heat loading? Oh, they pay, they pay attention to it just because um, I've, I've had problems before where where you're imaging and uh, the tube gets kind of hot and then you have to kind of stop what you're doing. Um, so it's similar to when they're doing scans at the clinic. So it's related to the tubes, not the patient? Yeah, it's related to the tubes, not the patient. Yeah, because it's just um, it's just KB times MAS, so there's no, yeah, yeah, no patient involved in that calculation. Yeah. Yep. That's one other question about the ESA technique. Yeah. So as you change energy, do you expect the signal from iodine to change much more than, you know, normal tissue? But you still expect the, you know, the, the sort of the ratio of normal tissue to change a little bit. Do you scale that out, or do you just subtract the images? I just subtract the images. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you were here when I showed the MAS mass attenuation curve. Right. And, like they're similar, right? But they're not exactly the same. Oh yeah, yeah. Normal tissue, and you kind of should yeah. know, right? So. Yeah. I guess what I was wondering is like, could you potentially increase the background subtract, like remove the background even better by just sort of slightly scaling the the intensities of like the lower. Yeah, I've, I've thought about doing that. And you know, it's, I mean, that would be a lot easier to do um, if, if you knew exactly what the background would be in an actual scan. It's easy with a tank of water, sure. you know. Um, and that's something that I thought about. Um, it was kind of a project I thought about. But when I started scanning a pig, I, I realized like, okay, well, you know, if you, you, you could hit an iodine region and then that could be incorporated into your scaling and then you'd be your scaling would be all messed up. So if you think about it, like you're, you're, you're saying scale with the background of the image to remove the soft tissue. Well, or, or scale, scale by essentially like the ratio of soft tissue, uh, like mass attenuation coefficients essentially. 
Oh well, yeah, and that's what. Oh sorry, yeah, that's what the weight actually does. Is that's why the weight is there uh, for dual energy is to remove the soft tissue from the image. So it actually tries. Okay. It attempts to scale. All right. So the, the weight. All right. So the weight. The weight is in there that accounts for that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 You got it. Yeah. Yeah. But I agree. Like that's that's the intention of of what dual energy is trying to do. Thank you.